My childhood school, cracked, silent, and brought to its knees through diminishing birth rates and amalgamation. It's a story that rural communities in my part of the world are being forced to read. And the ending is not what we'd hoped. The only silver lining in the loss brings me here several months earlier. The local Rotary Club of Grand Bend, along with the Middleburg Rotary Club of South Africa, has established a global literacy program whereby surplus things like desks, chairs, and books are shipped from Canada and given to schools in need throughout rural South Africa. The local school board, in effort to keep good equipment out of the landfill, helps make it happen and points the shipping containers to schools that were closing. For me and other grieving volunteers from the community, our container arrives on a frigid day in February. Getting 3,000 pounds of school equipment onto a shipping container requires a lot of manpower. And we, despite mixed feelings, were there to help. This is their 28th container and the passion found in the Rotarians seemed to help warm us on a bone-chilling day. I got interested in this because I heard of uh, the wonderful work they're doing in terms of services all over the world, and myself coming from a country which is uh, underdeveloped, Burundi in Africa, I really know the acute needs and uh, whoever or whatever organization is helping, it appeals to me. If schools get this kind of furniture, the money allocated to education can serve to other purposes, maybe training more people, recruiting more teachers, buying textbooks. So uh, it's really the circulation of goods all over the world, and that's a worthy cause. The easiest thing in the world is to fill up a landfill site. You know, send it somebody, send them by train, send them by carts, get rid of it, dump it. The rest of it, coordinating recycled was, is tough. You have to have people who are going to be able to gather the things together, pack them, send them somewhere where they're going to be used. It's obvious to me that we are making a difference, that we are making a, a change in the lives of young people that uh, they're going to remember forever. To get an education, you must have teachers, you must have a schoolroom, you must have books, you must have the product to, to teach with. You know, I used to call this program a drop in the bucket. We're doing much more than a drop in the bucket. By helping a child get an education, that that potentially will have benefits down the road. The world, the globe, is shrinking all the time. If we help them now get an education, I think we will help the future of those countries and those children to develop you know, a future for themselves. We pack it all. Desks, chairs, tables, shelves, filing cabinets, children's toys, ladders, mats, all obsolete things that once served our children and a purpose are stuffed in a metal box bound for sea. We pack everything. In the days afterwards, the Rotary asked me to travel to South Africa to see the project from the other side and to bring the story home. I, too, pack everything, with one exception. I returned to my school to grab something that the team had passed over months before. Something I've been thinking about for a long time. My third grade pencil sharpener, fastened between a chalkboard ledge and a window overlooking a cow pasture, was a touchstone for me, a reliable, purposeful and fascinating machine that kept worn things new and dull things sharp. Daily and with every turn, I wish it would do the same for me. I want to take the sharpener and keep it for myself, but decide that I should take it to where it rightfully belongs. The flight is long, 
and there's lots of time to think about the country that awaits me. Unfortunately, all I know about South Africa is what I've seen in mainstream media. My mind immediately goes to apartheid. In Afrikaans, apartheid means separateness. It was a racial segregation system that governed South Africa for nearly 50 years to protect domination of the minority, whites, over non-whites. There are 148 apartheid laws. Blacks had to carry IDs at all times and obey strict curfews. Apartheid was mainly economically motivated. Whites needed an inexpensive workforce to mine gold and diamonds because the success of that industry depended on keeping wages for the blacks law. It was illegal for workers to strike, forcing them into desperate cycles of being severely overworked and underpaid while trying to feed their families. Education was also divided. The state set up a separate education for blacks that received a fraction of the funding that white schools did. Apartheid ended in 1994. But years of segregation, lack of government funding, overpopulation, and present-day political corruption has resulted in an inadequate number of functional public schools to this very day. Cape Town is my first glimpse of South Africa. It is a breathtaking city and the backdrop for a meeting with a kingpin in the Global Literacy Project. I just found it interesting that, that you, you, know, you started your young life um, trying, to, uh, trying to beat the darkness with light, but through education, like basically bringing in contraband stuff to uplift people, and yet you're still doing it. Uh, but, now, but now I do it legally. Yeah. <laughs> in the 1970s, Charlie was part of the anti-apartheid movement and helped smuggle goods into the country to uplift the oppressed black and colored population. Now he runs a shipping logistics firm and gives his time to help the project navigate the bureaucracies of international shipping. The Rotary Clubs, with the help of Charlie, have managed to ship over 30 containers in five years a feat that would be impossible if using conventional channels. With regard to the type of work I do, it's relevant to customs clearing, arranging the delivery of the container, and ensuring everything is done promptly without any prejudice to any party concern. By the time the container has even left the US, on the vessel bound for South Africa. I have already completed the permit applications, the rebate applications, the VAT waiver from the, the different departments, to a point where we have pre-cleared this container even before it arrives at the port of Durban. I have a passion for it, as I've told you at the outset, that education is paramount in my skull. So anything that's going to be of benefit to any community on an educational basis, you can bet your last buck, I will go tooth and nail to ensure it gets delivered there. When I see a kid able to read and write four years, five years, six years old, I can say with my conviction, I helped that child to read and write. Since the thrust of the project is to donate school supplies, I assume that the rest of the country is in need of foreign aid. But I quickly realize that this is not entirely the case. A layover en route to Middleburg is spent in Pretoria, an administrative capital of South Africa. The buildings and monuments reflect diverse architectural styles and influences, creating a unique urban landscape and a popular tourist draw. I took in once again another beautiful city.
As we make our way eastward, however, I start paying closer attention to the residential areas and the common elements that all houses share. Private security is a billion dollar industry in South Africa, and people spare no expense when it comes to protecting themselves. As a Canadian who leaves his door unlocked year round, this seems like an overreaction. But once I start hearing first-hand accounts from my hosts of the grim realities of their society, I begin to realize how big the divide between wealth and total poverty really is. Highway medians and ditches are bursting with oleander, a beautiful flowering shrub that smells like wine. It is the most dangerous and poisonous of all garden plants. The analogy is not lost on me. Even though equality in South Africa has made great progress in the past 25 years, it is still clear that many of the rural and urban areas are still suffering from post-apartheid repercussions. As a part of the history and where we come from, we had private schools and we had Model C schools, which were the parents that could afford it, which contributed towards it. And then you had the, the poorer schools or township schools, which got very little aid or minimal assistance. So now the, the backlog is what needs to be uh, built up or caught up. So one can understand as well with urbanization, it's becoming a, a nightmare when your school boards and your principals are putting in budgetary needs, but in the meantime, you have a continual influx of people coming into the townships, into the squatter camps, into the rural settings. Charles Diner is the Middleburg Rotarian in charge of the distribution of goods received from Canada to South African schools. Alongside a handful of Canadian and South African Rotarians, I'm about to begin a whirlwind tour of schools that have benefited from the initiative. But first, I ask about the arrival of the very first container from Canada. The first container arrived in the Sabi Sands and I took a truck down to go and collect the, the materials. We then brought it up to Ellenslachter. Ellenslachter is a school from the colonial time. When we got here, it would make you cry. There was no books, no, no desks, and yet there were students attempting to get an education with rudimentary teaching staff, but one heck of a good leader in the name of Lean Kuhn. It's a small school in a very, very rural area. The inhabitants in the area, the children in the school, are very poor. It was 108 years, I think they, they said old, and it, it was just a shambles. The parents were farm workers. Many of them were unemployed. Some of the children stayed with their grandparents. There, were, there was no kitchen, there was no media center, there were sort of desks, there were no computers, there were no books. It was really a structure that kids came to and were kept busy for the day and then they uh, went home. And many of these kids, when they come to schools, was the first time they would be exposed to books uh, to magazines, they really, uh, they lived a life of exclusion. In order to make it sustainable, we put boreholes in, we put water in. We upgraded the kitchen. We put in the veggie gardens. Once the water came, the veggie gardens were the next natural process. It has enriched them, you know, I think to a certain extent it has given them hope because, you know, they had resources now which they did not have before. It's the first time that I saw physically what came out of the containers. I felt pleased that it was being put to good use because those very same things could have been dumped. And here we have people who are utilizing them in an orderly fashion, which made me proud. So we're seeing that that input is now bearing fruit. It's maybe small, it's a drop in the ocean, but uh, I guess every drop actually makes an ocean. So we, we can only do what we can do. You ask me what sustains, what keeps us going, 
I guess it's the reward of seeing smiling faces, spontaneity, smiles, um, children who are happy, who have, uh, I guess they, they feel that they've got a future. They're seeing things which perhaps they, well, not perhaps, which their parents did not have. It's clear that the efforts of the Rotary Clubs are not in vain. With the addition of desks, books, and other things I take for granted, schools are slowly becoming more than just a place to escape the harsh realities of day-to-day -day life. South Africa is a large country riddled with overpopulation, and most rural schools rely on volunteers and community donations in order to survive. I continue on to visit over 20 of these schools and see the work that still needs to be done. That is where the, uh, the helpers, that is where they prepare the food for the learners. But it is not a kitchen actually, it is just a storeroom. But they prepare everything there and then during breaks, the learners, the, uh, the primary school learners, they eat the in the class. The food? The, uh, the uh, department, department, the education yes. department provides and the food. And are the ladies that work there volunteers? No, actually, uh, they are actually volunteers because uh, the payment that they get is merely a stipend. 840 rand per month. Per month? Per month. Yeah, per month. Yeah. per month. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's not a week. So um, it's okay a week's break, but what we do is we tell them that they must come with, you know, little bags so that at least we can give them rations for the time that they are not at uh, school. Send yeah. some home. Yeah, yeah, send home, you know, so right. that at least we know that at home right. there is something for them to eat because the unemployment rate amongst the parents is also very, very high. So the parents have no money. The parents have them. no money, yeah. The parents have no money. It's, the majority of them come from single parent homes. Majority. Uh, yeah, the majority. And some of them are even staying with a grandmother. And some of them are the heads of the house, understand? So that is actually... Because parents have died. Yeah, the parents have died. died and age or whatever. Yes, it's a serious thing, really. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when it comes to social service and whatever, they are not actually very active, understand? Because at times we do, do we have problems, like for instance, maybe this child is staying with, with an aunt or whatever, and then, you know, so there's some, some quarrel and the child eventually is chased out because we had such a case last week where the aunt just told the child that she must leave. And of course, what we did was we called the aunt to ask her now, if you chase this child, what is going to happen to her? So you're actually now chasing her to go and stay with, yeah. with a man who will provide, understand? And you see that, that now has other problems, you know? Yeah. The, preg yeah. Yeah, the pregnancies and unwanted children, you know, and all those things. Not surprisingly, these schools bear little resemblance to the one I attended as a child. The buildings themselves are not completely dissimilar. Minus the fact that many still lack desks and books, they have four walls, a roof, and a teacher at the head. But it's the spirit of the children that reminds me that I'm in a strange and foreign land. More than convention or a means to an end, education is life and hope here. Remember, a baby child or a baby girl cannot have future without education. You, if you are my boyfriend, you can run away from me, but education will never run away from you. That is one thing which is reliable, education. Wherever you go, even though you don't, you don't get money out of it, but you have got wisdom. And remember, it's what we live for. We live for wisdom. Then it is very crucial for a human being, called a species called human being, to have education. You must be embarked with education so that you can lead the way you want to go. There's no one who can lead people. Remember, we are, we are, we are living in a world where we have to lead other people. You cannot leave, lead other people without having education. You need to learn and read in order to, get, to lead other people forward. Children who, the only meal they get is the five days in the week. They get their one meal a day. On the weekend, they don't. School holidays, they don't. When they come from child-headed families, when you understand the, um, the dynamic of a lost population, how do, you, how do you translate that? 
when the child comes into the classroom and has books, has desks, where they've been sitting on, on tins, on tires, and you suddenly give them desks, how do you... It must be joy. There's no other way. There's just plain joy simply because you can sit on a desk, you have a book, somebody's caring for you, somebody's feeding you. That is... That's just love. I think of the efforts and sacrifices made by people back home. Through the pain of change and loss there, a future and a hope is being furnished here. The fact that we're putting bums in school chairs is making a difference in the lives of any child. How do you quantify that? How do you take that back to your school boards and to your people and say, don't destroy them, don't shred them. There's a need. Here are children. A book read is knowledge gained. The team knows that giving material things can only last for so long, and if not handled carefully, could lead to a dependency on foreign aid. With the rural population on the rise and the divide between wealth and poverty getting wider, a strategy for sustainability is foremost on their minds. We realize that we have certain weaknesses in our process and the weaknesses that we are facing at the moment in terms of making this global literacy project work relate firstly to the fact that we are all volunteers and the project is becoming too big for a bunch of volunteers to run. Okay, in order to carry this project forward, we need to create a team. And the team has to consist of Canadians, and other people, but people who are committed towards working and continuing what we're doing. But we can't stop at that. Where we have to go on to is the next step, where we improve the willingness and the culture of teaching. And in order to do that, the next step would include bringing educational specialists from Canada to South Africa and vice versa to create experiential learning so that those teachers teach other teachers to make a difference in the lives of those children. By shaping young people's minds and lives, that is our future. Um, we can't change older people. Um, we need to start at the basics. And the only way we can give our children opportunities is by giving them education. Every child taken off the street is a, is a potential winner down the line. My time with people I have quickly come to like and admire draws to an end.
Before I head home, I fly to Cape Town once more with my Canadian counterparts to meet with various people that could potentially aid the project and extend its reach. Our final stop is at a township orphanage outside the city that has reached out for help. En route, I consider how this whole experience has been staggering and how it has thrown me off course. I'm thankful that we are heading to the orphanage because I know that this is the time where my gift finally finds its place in the story. The last chance for it to be left where it belongs and used for its purpose again. Turned with a smile by just one boy, one girl. This is whole place. It started out in 1994, um, and that was the start of our when apartheid was abolished. Uh, but you can see, look, 20, 20 years later, I mean, you're still living in the, these conditions. But it is up to us here to be able to uplift these kind of areas um, and not leave it up into our government's hands. This lady, Letitia, she's out of her own pocket. She's, she doesn't even have a job. I mean, but, but she has uplifted 20 other families uh, and, 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 and helped them and housed them and grown the kids given the kids education out of magazines. She's, got, she's built her own little library. She's built her own little sewing office. She's built her own little garden in the back. You know, that is what touches hearts. That is what should be moved and taken to the world and shown the world what people still do, the hearts that people still have, not just the destruction of lives, but the upliftment of lives. That is what people should see. That is what should, the message that should be going out from Africa. Not the distraction that Africans have, but the, the upliftment and the good hearts that Africans have. That's the message that should go out. If you have a look around, if you could, if you could see the pictures, that the message that will be coming back to you guys is the message of upliftment, the message of growth. In five years' time, this should be such a buzzing community, not a, a, a community of, of destruction, but a, but, a, but a community of life, a community of godliness, a community of, of giving, not of taking from each other, but of educating the young to become leaders of society, not of killing a society, but, but, but growing a society. I head back to my fancy hotel. I pack everything.
a seemingly insignificant thing used by a child has found its proper place and helps to tell a story of hope and all that hope contains.